kept film and try, but <laughs> ouais, that's difficile. not going to work. Non, je... Et tu vas travailler pour toi-même, alors Oui, censorship on the internet and uh, for that I tried to uh, do a work of fiction, a design fiction with a, a fictional totalitarian government that creates a censored, very monitored uh, national intranet like uh, some like uh, in North Korea or Myanmar uh, that already exists okay. to deal with that, that problem and uh, so this book is a, both a manifesto and a command manual uh, to every citizen of that fictional country that wants to access the internet and inside there is a lot of political propaganda and uh, doubtful technical information but also a counter manifesto written in uh, invisible UV ink by uh, political hackers who believe, on the contrary, on the openness and the uh, free internet. So, yeah, I'm working on the scenario and the political background for my political game, and I've decided to do an object to materialize the uh, two ideologies that uh, come, will come up in the game. It's a UV lamp. Oh, you mean it projects UV, UV lights. Ah. So it's not a question of dark and light, it's a question of uh, UV. Uh, UV? Let me see again. Oh, it brings us something that was not there before. Yeah, exactly. It's like... Uh, yeah. Nice. It's uh, invisible to the human eye. But if you project that, the ink yes. reacts to ah. the to the light. Interesting. And you can see the uh, yeah. That's the, very interesting. The other content. So yeah, it's uh, so UV light. It's uh, very um, yeah, it's very simple. It's very handmade. You can do that at home and. Uh, oh, have people done this before? Sorry. Have people used that technique? Oh yeah, before? yeah. They use that in uh, the uh, money. The um, oh really? Yeah, the passport also. It's a technique used to. Uh, it's interesting. Yes. To securize the certain documents and uh, yeah. Yeah. No. Try the the
Okay, here we go. Just use my finger too. One more time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. If you don't know what to do, you can click here. Yeah. So the artist. Oh wow! Oh, so you can create. That's really cool. Wow, look at that. That's very cool. So do you have to keep it here, or no, you can just you can do that you can away. Do that. Yeah, yeah. And once this ends or this is completed, uh, you then have you to return. continue okay. until you you you, you see uh, the. Uh, the button like this, oh, yeah. sorry. and then you get outside and you can continue. Uh, oh, this is great! Yeah. Right. Here you can see what they are thinking. to bring our uh, yeah. the, the student games from UCLA in the game festival oh. without having to submit them and go through the whole uh, entry process. Make it worth it. Yeah. UCLA game on. Yeah. So we have student games running on. Alright, and we are co-hosting this event tonight with our dear friends and partners at Swissnex SF and we're so pleased to be here. Uh, and before we get started, I just wanted to uh, uh, thank our uh, sponsor tonight, Moreno Sparkling Wine. We can't call it champagne. Uh, they're here in California. It's Moreno Beverly Hills. We're talking to our keynote presenter, Chuck Eiler, who I'm so excited to have here with us tonight. Uh, Chuck has been in this industry for, uh, for, for a long time and has seen many changes. <laughs> Um, I, I want to uh, turn it over to our friends at Swissnex, um, and they're going to introduce and talk a little bit about the wonderful game exhibits that are all around us tonight. So, Andrea, thank you. Thank you, Ben. So, welcome to all of you. We're very happy uh, to have you all tonight for uh, this Transmedia meetup that we are hosting for the third time. Um, and really excited to hear Chuck Eiler tell us more about the future of gaming and, uh, and entertainment. So Swissnex is an open house connecting the dots between Switzerland and California in the fields of art, science, education and innovation. And we are especially thrilled to have this beautiful exhibition in our space showing the best projects of, uh, of uh, students from three universities. <laughs> Uh, two Swiss and one Californian, so Geneva University of Art and Design, Zurich University of the Arts, and UCLA Game Lab. And uh, also all the students, the Swiss students that are here tonight are going to head to LA next week to 
to do a workshop at the, uh, the Game Lab, which is really great. Um, also, uh, the Swiss uh, games are not only to be seen here, but also at GDC, where five studios are showing their work, and also one has been nominated for the IGF Awards. Um, <clears throat> so go and have a look. Uh, without further delay, I will pass the mic to Douglas Stanley, who is an artist and professor at Geneva University of Art and uh, in the Master Program of Media Design. So have fun and play. <laughs> okay, great. I'm just going to keep this really quick. I want to pass the mic over. So hi, welcome. Um, yeah, we worked hard on this exhibit. Um, a bunch of students are here, so after the talk, we'd be really happy to uh, present uh, all the different uh, works. Uh, what I have on my back here is a work from uh, the UCLA uh, uh, Games uh, Games Lab. We're working at the uh, Geneva University of Art and Design, um, and let me just quickly sort of point out a couple of students. You can raise your hands. We've got. Uh, well, just raise your hands, go ahead, and we've got uh, Marion and Benjamin, and uh, uh, well, anyway, I <laughs> can't really see them all that well. Um, but since this is a transmedia uh, event, there are two works just very quickly that I wanted to uh, point out. There's uh, Marion uh, Barre uh, has an interesting uh, book that you can ask her more about. Uh, instead of presenting a game on a screen, uh, she's actually brought a user's manual of a game. And there's an interesting twist, and you're going to have to use the flashlight to discover that interesting twist. And then uh, we have another uh, work here that I think also might be uh, interesting to people uh, thinking about these questions of uh, cross-media. And if you could just give us just a brief little uh, sentence description, and I'll translate uh, for you. Sure. Hi, guys. I'm Baptiste. Uh, my project is uh, Binary Land. It's an uh, interactive uh, comic paper book. There is a uh, made of uh, 36 pages and 22 uh, gameplay inside the book. You start to beginning the reading and uh, you start to to read on the book. And then when you you see a framed picture, you can continue the story on the smartphone. And then you can play with the main characters and their environment. And uh, it's like this, yeah. And, and so then you can go back and forth from uh, paper to book and sort of follow the story as it moves from, uh, from the two uh, different mediums. So we've had a lot of work like that. Um, there's also some uh, UCLA uh, Game Lab students here. Uh, and so, um, and, and we'll be opening up this door after the talk, and so make sure you uh, check out some of, the, some of that work, okay? So let me hand the microphone back over. Thank you. And, and I want to say a few things about the students that are here. I, I came to the opening night on Tuesday, and I am so impressed with all of the exhibits that are here. There is not an Angry Bird imitator in the bunch. <laughs> and, and I'm so pleased to see that our students, that the young people that are coming into this industry are being innovative, they're being socially conscious, they're being so inventive and creative with what they're bringing to bear. And, and I think that that's one of the things that, that we in the games and creative industry are always looking for is free thinkers who are going to help to really move the needle. And we think that games and entertainment can actually even solve world problems. And so uh, we're, we're looking forward to these young people getting into the industry with us. So I encourage you all to check out every single one of the 24 exhibits that we have. Many of them actually cross the boundaries of what we consider transmedia. Uh, they're no longer just a single source game. Uh, they go across multiple screens and multiple venues. And, uh, and so I encourage you to check out uh, what these people have put together for us. And, and so with that, I, I actually, uh, you know, we're, we titled this event uh, The Future of Games and Entertainment. And, and I really personally love the idea of bringing uh, these youngest of game developers together with people like me who have been here forever and, and Chuck and I who have been around uh, this also industry <laughs> also <laughs> for a long time. Come on up. Um, so, so I, I, I'd actually, I'm, I'm so pleased to be able to uh, bring tonight to this group uh, Chuck Eiler. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about about his background, and then we're, we're going to run through some slides. But Chuck has been in every aspect of media, from animated 
television programs to special effects in films. Uh, he was on the Academy Award winning team with young Sherlock Holmes at ILM. Uh, he made um, Mighty Mouse back in the day. Wow. <laughs> uh, started at Atari when Atari was just getting started and now is just, uh, one of the head art directors at Disney Playdom. So he's very much a transmedia artist and uh, you know it, the, the best way to predict the future is to invent it but it's also to look back on the past and understand where we're going, what the trajectory is going to be. So with that let me turn it over to Chuck. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, very interesting to be here. In order to uh, put this together, I had to look at my whole career in high speed. So this is art school. I was talking to the professors here back at um, the uh, pipe drawing there. Um, my art teacher really liked drawings that were drawings and then turned into reality and then turned back into a drawing again. And most of us figured that out and so we would always do that in our drawings. So the pipe is an example where there's the drawing in the back and then it turns into a real pipe. And it's a All right. um, this is when I was in Ann Arbor and I was starting to do silk screening. I started to do t-shirts and these are three of the t-shirts I did. So this is my early professional beginnings. Go blue, go blue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at the University of Michigan. Um, this is silk screen stuff, and then this bottom image is from my personal film called Earthly Beams. This is the brain at the end. Once I went to LA, and I decided I had to get into the animation business, I got to work on Flash Gordon for filmation, and draw things like Emperor Ming and uh, female villains. There's Flash. I also worked on Brunhilde for Fabulous Funnies, and here's a little Mighty Mouse. This is what the drawings looked like before they were into painted. And then they were interviewing for animators to move up to San Francisco, which I thought was a wonderful idea, and to work on the movie Plague Dogs, which was the sequel to Watership Down, but with dogs. It's really depressing. Has anybody seen Plague Dogs? It's a really depressing movie. You actually care about the dogs. I, I describe it as a football game where your team loses and then gets shot. <laughs> it's like they're cool dogs and they're having a hard time and they just anyone could rescue them, but it doesn't happen and then they drown. <laughs> and like, this, I, thought, I thought this is the saddest movie I've ever heard about and I'm working on it. But in working on the play dogs, as, as things go well and surprises happen. I met the people that um, ended up going to ILM and said, hey, we're at ILM and we need help, come help us. So I got to do things like elect electrocute Dennis Quaid, <laughs> which was really fun. There's another sad story. When we were, I was working on this scene and the editor and I were talking and we said, what would really happen if you touched that weapon? And the art director said, nothing, it's a prop. <laughs> and we were like, oh. Um, also got to work on one of the weirdest movies ever made, Howard the Duck. <laughs> on, on YouTube, there's ten embarrassing scenes from Howard the Duck that are totally embarrassing. But uh, it was interesting work and I got paid for it. I also got to make Dennis Quaid have lots of things come out of his head and electrocute him again in inner space. This was the scene. We the technology at that time, we worked on 22 field paper, so it was just huge sheets of paper. It was like HD animation, but with a pencil. And these lines on here are actually drawn in pencil and then optically printed on top. Do you top. guys know what a pencil is? <laughs> <laughs> You've heard of them? This I showed John Lasseter's scene because I couldn't find my scene, but um, I did the ice cracking and some shadow work. This is the very famous scene where the, the very first computer graphic scene in a movie. And then up above that is from batteries not included. We had to do all the shadows for all those robots, so they were all hand drawn shadows. It's very thankless work. If you do it right, nobody can tell. So after that. I saw people I knew at the parties and they seemed sort of calm and well rested and I asked them what they were doing and they said they were working at Atari Games. And I went, oh, that's interesting. So I went down to visit them and 
I was the seventh animator hired at Atari. Uh, engineers were just figuring out that they couldn't do all the graphics themselves, so they, they were willing to share it with us. And it was wonderful because they thought everything we did looked so real. They were like, wow, that looks so cool. So this was a game called Thunder Jaws. It was the first game I worked on. And uh, this was the very first character I worked on, which was a bionic wolf. And my assignment was he needs to walk, turn front, jump, bite, and death. And I said, that's like really bad haiku. <laughs> but the, the thing about, this is every image of this character. So this is the whole life of the character in the game. So the cool thing about video games at that time was total melodrama. You had to do the attack, the dodge, and then the death scene for your character. So for a spider robot, I did the quivering leg. It was really fun. Um, what I liked about video games compared to working at ILM at that time is that at ILM the script was written, there was a drawing for what the scene was supposed to look like, it was pretty confined work. With video games, they were kind of making it up as they went along and they'd say, we need an enemy. And I'd go, how about a spider robot? And they'd go, sure. So it was eighth grade study hall heaven. Um, in those days, games were like 200,000 maybe total to make, so it wasn't big stakes, and Atari was making money hand over foot, so it was just a blast. This character, when I finally saw it in the game, the engineer said, your character's in, do you want to see it? And I said, sure. It was a side shooter, so I saw the wolf coming and I shot, and my shot didn't hit it because I was too high. So then I ducked, and I shot at him, and he jumped over my shot and killed me. And I was like, how could this happen? And she goes, <laughs> the engineer Natalie said, yeah, it's kind of like your own kid becomes a highway patrolman and gives you a ticket. <laughs> but I was totally hooked from that time on, because in everything else, you plan it and you do it, and there it is. With a video game, you make a set of rules and a set of possibilities, and then you can be surprised by what happens. And that just, that's what hooks me on video games and interactive media. So, to take this to new heights, this is the next game we made. And uh, for this, we actually rotoscoped real people and put them in the game. Uh, this gal, Angel, we had a woman on our team, Sharon, who was helping Angel get dressed. And we didn't know this, but she was telling her, you don't have to do this. You know, you don't have to do this. And, and Angel was telling Sharon, I, I want to do this. It's OK. I want to wear the leather and like kick people. So she did it. We made a game called Batman. This is. Below here is what drove the game. And it was basically a custom Apple IIe was what an Atari arcade video game was. And all the graphics were on EEPROMs, and we would have to burn those, and they couldn't be changed when we were done. So the entire game runs on that circuit board in the bottom. This was a really fun game to work on. This was Steel Talons. It's an arcade game, and it's side by side. You fly two helicopters and fight against each other. And it's kind of confusing because your spatial orientation is changing all the time, and this is another example of how you can be surprised by what happens in a game. But I was playing against Glenn McNamara, who was a really deadly killer helicopter pilot, and we were chasing each other around, and he got me. And I went, darn it, Glenn got me. And as I was falling, I hit him and killed him and took him out. <laughs> and I was like, yes! And I'd never seen that happen, but it was a possibility because that was how the logic worked. This, I was shocked to find there's a wiki entry for this game, but this was never released. This was a game called Beathead. It's kind of hard to see what you do, but we actually did those tiles appear and disappear to the beat, and you have to jump around sort of knowing that the tile is going to be there when you jump. It was really fun. So after that, I went to Electronic Arts, and I got to work on a game called World War II Fighters, which was a uh, flight sim. And Computer graphics have gotten to the point that instead of using 64 by 96 and 16 colors, we're now using LightWave and doing renders with lighting of built rooms for a museum. This was the, the very first opening screen of the game. And I got to build the tank and use the model of the airplane and construct this whole thing and light it, and it was really fun. This is what the planes look like in the game. And we did, we actually modeled the cockpits for the museum shots, and then we used photos of those models to construct the real-time version that he flew. And we also did 
those are individual images for the reflections. I love it that we imitate the imperfections of lenses to make things look real, but we actually built every one of those circles so that it would look like the sun was gleaming on things. This is the P51 Mustang cockpit, my favorite. Oops, am I going backwards? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go this way. This is the uh, Messerschmitt cockpit, also fun. So after that, my entire team went and did a launch title for the PlayStation 2. And I wanted to kill Sony. They were saying, they were saying that the PS2 was the emotion engine, and they set everybody's expectations that it was infinite, and then we had to deal with the limitations of it. I, I like to say that the emotion it generated was frustration. <laughs> But uh, we didn't have any tools, and we were trying to do a launch title, and it was just, I mean, we were long hours and all kinds of stuff to get this done. And then in America, the PS2 didn't really happen, so we had all these games in the stores, and I think there were 15 PS2s in North America that Christmas. This is some of the things we did with lighting. I was very proud on the bottom shot that I did multiple shadows for the night scene. And then... Um, the Sims had come out. How many people know The Sims? <laughs> Good. There's a game where everybody said, what? How, why are people going to play this? This will never happen. And I read a magazine article where they said people were talking about their couple and how they weren't getting along and how concerned they were. So it really changed the gamescape that The Sims existed. I thought it was really cool. I ended up working on the console version of The Sims because I knew the PS2 after my NASCAR experience. So these are from what was called Bustin' Out, which was the second Sims console title. And we're trying to do fancy things with translucent water textures and, and effects and lighting. This one, the scene of these people, how much time am I taking? Um, the scene of this people is all faked, but you know it's additive for the lights themselves, and then there's an additive circle on the ground to be the light hitting the ground. We're actually generating shadows, but if you look, there's only a single shadow that's being generated from the center light, and it's all just fake, and it was really fun. And the lights would blink on and off, and the shadows would blink on and off. This was our, you can tell, Apple interface had come out, and we're making everything into gelatin bubbles. <laughs> so this is dangerous. When you're doing things at the time, you're thinking, you're being really contemporary, and then you look back at it and go, oh, that's so, that era. <laughs> this was The Herbs. I actually got a nomination for art directing The Herbs, and then got to be a judge for the next three years. The way it works for the Academy of Interactive Sciences is if you get nominated, then you're a judge for the next three years. <laughs> and um, this is pretty clever. I think this scene shows it better. This was on a PS2. And those aren't ray traced reflections. What we're doing is we have a translucent street, and then we have lights that are on planes that face the camera that are under the street. But we made it look like we had a much more powerful rendering engine than we had. More herb stuff. And we had, we were trying to be edgy. Don't ever try and be edgy. <laughs> and so we were trying to have social interactions that were pushing boundaries and people would see them finish and go, we're, we can't put that in the game, you guys can't do that. So we had to evolve a process where we shot video of the game designer and the lead animator acting out the scene, and then show that to people, and then it would be either approved or disapproved before we spent two weeks animating it. This is Sims 2 Pets, which was the next console game. We were basically doing a Sims console game every year. So we'd just do all the graphics over again, and Fortunately, we had the same engine, so we were adding two new features every year, and it was an environment we understood. This is also Sims 2 Pets. There, there's all kinds of limitations you have, like, we don't know what you did with your house, and we can't show it, so we have an icon that a house has been built, or a, an icon that a house hasn't been built. I was pretty proud of the lighting in here. I figured out I would use the game lighting, for the sim, and then I would add a kick light to just, like they do in the movies, to help pull them out. So they had an edge light on them that was parented to the camera, and wherever they went, you had an edge light on them. This is uh, Sims 2 Pets. This is training your dog in the park. More Sims 2 Pets. 
This is Sims 2 Castaway, which I told the team there's no enigma. This is a cliche inside a cliche. <laughs> um, but everybody knew The Sims and everybody knew Castaway movies, so we thought we'll, we'll have The Sims be castaways. So you start out on this boat and then bad things happen and you end up here. <laughs> but you do have a book. And uh, you actually learn skills on the island and learn how to survive. This is, I, I was really proud. I went to a lot of effort to have nice day and night lighting and there would be pretty sunsets. Nice water effects. Um, that's enough of that. The next console game was the Sim Animals. And we had a tradition, EA is really into printing posters for your game. But I would try and take advantage of it and basically use those posters as what I call the children encyclopedia of our game design. And if anybody came to ask what the game was about, we could say, here's the game. We could walk them down this hall and they would understand. After I left EA, I went to work at Play First that was doing download casual games, and it was being back on Saturday morning cartoons. It was kind of fun. It was like after all this 3D and lighting stuff, then I was doing flat, flash characters. And these are icons I got to do for Cooking Dash for the iPhone. And what it, it's, it's like, I'm suddenly back to 64 by 64, and so the, the interesting thing is that Things evolve, and they go back, and they go, they go forward again. The, the interesting thing about this is I tried to have more french fries and more potatoes, and you could not recognize them. So they have to be iconic. You have to be able to tell pretty easily what those things are. So I kept doing less french fries and less french fries, and finally went, we can see them now. This is an interesting game, and we, I talked to Beth about my medic controls and stuff, but we had to do Diner Dash for the iPad, and we didn't have any iPads. We weren't one of those cool companies that can get an iPad early and get to play it. So we were making an iPad, iPad game without hardware and trying to figure out what that would be. So what we did is we printed out the size of an iPad, and we all sat in a room and said, what's fun to do with your hands? We just kind of said, it's fun to kind of pinch things, and it's fun to like flick your fingers at things. So we made that on the bottom of the, uh, the larger image there. We had a, a, your helper friend could do little cooking exercises in that smaller area of the screen, and we can actually move that anywhere on the screen. And so we had, in this one you press, and you get a nice sizzling sound out of the hamburger. But we had cutting and slicing, and um, by the time we got an iPad and were able to do it, it actually worked. So our whole prototyping experience worked, and it was fun to do. Unfortunately, there weren't enough iPads to really justify how much money we'd spend on the game, so we had to stop. The next thing I did was social games for Facebook, and this was the social version of an existing Play First game, which was Chocolatier, and these are just some images from it. This was the, the chocolate mixing machine, which I got to design, which was fun. And then your storefront, completely empty, and then you have to stock it and try and get customers to come in there. These are tickets and the world map, kind of the graphic design edges of trying to make the game fun. And then, this, have any of you heard of Love and Death Pit? It's a download game, and I told the game designer, this is as cool as a Spanish soap opera. <laughs> but um, it, it's a game, that, she was a huge Twilight fan, and so she wanted to do a game about a vampire and a woman who fall in love. So the, the funny thing about this game is, at night you play as the vampire, in the daytime you play as the woman, and in the course of the game, you're falling in love with yourself. <laughs> so I called it a narcissistic Spanish soap opera. But it was really dramatic and, and really fun to work on. And enjoyed it. So that's my career till now. I can't tell you what I'm working on at Disney, but it's really cool, and I can't wait to tell you about it when we release it. But this is um, how young I looked at ILM and Atari and me with my new boss at the bottom. So that's my career so far. I'm nowhere near done yet, and I'm looking for new adventures. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So 
you know, I, obviously you can see why I've invited Chuck here, and we're all so happy to have him here. He's uh, uh, been around the world in, uh, in games and entertainment. And, uh, and I've got some questions, but we want this to be interactive. And so my co-founder of Transmedia, SF Maya, is in the audience if you have a question. Uh, Transmedia is interactive. Yeah. So, uh, you know, jump in there, and this is our opportunity. And then, of course, we'll be here afterwards. I'm mostly drinking champagne, though, so, you know. Uh, you, but you can find us afterwards. So she will be allowed. <laughs> so, 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 Chuck, you, you did a great job of, uh, of taking us into, you know, the past. And, and the future of entertainment and games is such a big topic that it's always good to start with the past. And you showed a lot of the highlights. One of the things that we talk about in the startup world is this concept of fail forward. So, so tell us a little bit about something that wasn't one of the big successes and, and what you learned from it. Interesting. You mean in, in terms of projects I was involved in? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, it's interesting. I would say the beathead game that I showed you that was pretty much a pretty innovative idea was a rhythm game. No one had ever seen anything like that. And Atari's system for opening a game was build it, stick it in the arcade for a week, and then see how much money you make, and if you make money, then it's a good thing. And if I had had the presence of mind I have now, we made $25 in the same week that uh, uh, Street Fighter made $1,000. So they went, this game isn't working. And uh, if I had known what I know now, I would have said, so it's not hurting anything, let's just leave it there for a while. Because after that first week, they pulled it and they killed the project. And I thought, but later I thought, nobody was expecting that game to be there. They would have to discover it and sort of figure it out. So um, I wish that we had just let it sort of develop for a while. It wouldn't have cost Atari any more money to just leave it there. It, it, it's interesting that you bring up the issue of discovery because that's one of the biggest issues that we face today as game developers and entertainment designers is discovery in this world with half a million apps in the iTunes, half a million games in the iTunes store and more apps. Uh, and so that brings up another question about the past. So, you know, a lot has changed and you talked in your presentation about, you know, uh, and, and we've, I, I've experienced this myself is, you know, we started out developing for video windows that were tiny and then we came back to the iPhone and we're like, hey, deja vu <laughs> all over again. So what's, what's not changed in the industry? Well, that's interesting. Um, our biology, what entertains us, is been around for a long time and will be around for a long time. So I think you know what excites a human isn't going to change that much. Technology changes, but um, what we care about, what we want to know about it. Somebody was telling me about the new high-end video games where there's wolf attacks, and I went, "Oh, we all understand that. You know, it's very dramatic, but it's." Uh, what works, works, and then you try to apply that to technology. I, I was going to say, sort of related to that, when we got to the DS, it was 320 by 240, which was the same resolution as an Atari arcade machine, and I went, oh, now there's two of them, and there's probably more processing power than we ever had in the arcade. Um, yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it is funny how the game systems have evolved, and the entire industry and the technology has evolved. And, and with that evolution, I mean, we find ourselves in 2013 with the greatest and most expansive game audience of any time. Uh, the game industry itself grew at a GDP of to over 10%, uh, where, where the entire economy grew at less than 3%. So this is a, a growing space. And more and more game players all the time. The fastest going, growing game segment are women over the age of 30. Uh, and, and so what, what does this growing audience of, of gamers mean to you as a game developer? More people to make games for. <laughs> um, it's interesting you bring that up. When we were at Atari, people were saying, hey, how can we get girls to play games? And the thinking then was like, girls don't care about games. Games are gadgets. Girls care about socializing. Girls don't play games. Well, they figured out how to make games that include socializing and now women are playing games. So, um, the limitations that you see can be gotten to. I mean, it's, if, if you say this doesn't work for this reason, um, there's a way around that. There's, if you can make it entertaining, you can engage people. Do you develop 
games for a specific psychographic? Do you do you think that I want to think I like about psychographic? <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you want to? I mean, you know, in in in, in our parlance in our industry, Zynga talks about the you know they design games for the forty year old woman, uh -huh. um, and they have this psychographic of who she is, the soccer mom, and doing all of this. But in in at Disney and in your own design, do, do you design for a psychographic? That's funny. Um, what we do, you, know, you all make art, right? I mean, I think the best art you kind of make for yourself, and hopefully it appeals to other people. We do have a woman on our team who is the exact age of our demographic, so we always say, okay, so what do you think? Um, we, we try and make things that are fun. We try and make things that engage us and would engage other people. And then we do an incredible amount of user testing. We have a facility in Palo Alto where we can give people the game. We ask them to, while they're playing the game, talk out loud about what they're thinking. So we can just hear their process when they're confused, when they're trying to find something. And they're polite enough to do that. And we take away things that confuse them. We, we all talk about how brutal the user testing is, because they just never understand that stuff you think is so obvious. <laughs> you, you have to go, it's yellow, it's throbbing, come on. <laughs> so uh, um, I think it's really good. Um, family members, if, if you don't have an official testing thing, but try your game on people, sit them down. What do you see? You know, do you understand it? In, in our world, in the transmedia world, we, we believe in this concept of pre-typing, right? And then the lean startup methodology, we talk about that you should always be embarrassed by the first product that you release. Oh, that's, that's good. And, that's and, and obviously Disney doesn't do this, but, but do you do this in your tests and with family and friends and with each other? I think we should do it more. I mean, we're, we're too careful and trying to do safe stuff. That's not always the case, but because it's really expensive, the, the larger companies are not going to take huge risks. But the, the best way to deal with that is, is trying to come up with a quick way to prototype. When, when I worked with Ed Log on Steel Talents, he had a just flat blue sky, and I said, let me give you a gradient. You know, we can make the sky pretty. And he goes, I don't want that. He says, if it's fun, ugly, it'll be fun, pretty. And, and he would just really want to rough the game in and play it. And then if it's fun, make it pretty. And I think that kind of like rough prototyping, simple trying things. I, I recommend the IDO company, when they try things, they build a foam core version of a vending machine and have somebody push the can out. But you just, you know, try and try things as quickly as possible. I, I have heard people that do a board game version of their game to see how it plays as a board game and test it out. So any way that you can get something alive to interact with is good. I agree completely, and I think that you know what we've seen, and I was saying here tonight, there's a lot of experimentation and a lot of a real, you know, uh, bravery and outreach uh, in the student work that we're seeing. And you mentioned something there. You talked about you know the big companies being a little bit safe, and what we found at GDC this year is that 47 percent of people that are walking through the door that have bought a ticket are identifying themselves as indies. And that they're looking, 57% are saying that they're looking to develop for, um, for tablets or iPhones. Uh, so, so what do you think this indie market is doing to that realm of safe of EA and, and the big console players? Blazing the trail. Um, <laughs> when I go to GDC, I go to the indies first because I feel like all the other stuff is predictable and uh, more of the same. So. It, to me, that's where the interesting things are going on. If you if you like films and you go to an independent film festival, those are the people who cared enough about that idea to make it anyway. And it's usually got something behind it. So um, I think that's where the real stuff is happening. Um, I go there just to appreciate it and um, hope that we can do something that interesting ourselves. Cool. Well, you know, I'm going to actually uh, like see if we can't pull out the crystal ball. Uh, this is the hardest thing to do, right? Because as, as I said earlier, the easiest way to predict the future is to invent it. And so we're counting on everybody in this room to help with that. Uh, so if you've got some comments uh, about some of these things, um, the games business is one that has a lot of movement that's currently happening. Um, and we actually even see it around the rooms, right? Right here we've got a couple of perceptual computing 
installations. In this other room, there's a, there's a great interactive game uh, that involves perceptual computing. So let's talk about some of these future technologies and how you see them impacting your work at, at Disney Platum and your work as a designer. Um, so let's start with perceptual computing. Explain to me what perceptual computing is. <laughs> okay, so that baby is looking at us and she has been all night. So, <laughs> so okay. what, what we're looking at here is, is other than handheld in interaction with, uh, with the computing system, if you smile at that baby, they'll smile back. Uh, and, and gesture tech, right, with like a, um, a Xbox Live and, and, and the Wii. Yeah, connect. Oh, there you go. See the head move? That's great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of something profound to say about it. I think it's it's delightfully entertaining, and my feeling with all the possibilities is, as soon as they're well used, then they're totally justified. I mean, um, so that um, I never would have guessed that Facebook or an iPhone would have been game platforms, right. but as soon as there's games that work on them, then they are viable. So um, the way that make those things work is to make a really entertaining me. version of the game and the ideal. You know, and, and one of the things I want to say about that for, for this audience, and, and, and I have been in this industry myself for decades, and you know, we were so super excited about holograms and hologram technology, and this technology has been around for decades. And we have not yet been able to integrate it into anything more exciting than, you know, an imprint on your credit card. <laughs> you know, it, it, it makes a great paperweight. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, so there's there are technologies that actually can be fully implemented and that can be really exciting and used. And you know, and there are things that you just have to wonder about. You know, Google at South by Southwest uh, introduced the Google Shoe. Did anybody see the Google Shoe? The shoe that talks to you. And I'm thinking, mm, maybe not. I don't really want my shoes talking to me. <laughs> so it, it, it's interesting. <laughs> but now there, there, there have been some really incredible movements. Yeah. What are your shoes telling you? Yeah, either change your socks, walk faster. That's um, right. So, but so one of the things that I want to get to, and then I'd love to open it up, and if anybody has questions, start raising your hand so Maya can see where you're at. Um, so there's been this huge movement with all of the improvements in GPUs and, and pixel format and, and this speed and processing power of the systems with new micro uh, consoles coming out in the market. The most popular, one of the most popular games today is Minecraft, a low res open world game. And, and so what do you think of that phenomenon? I think it's fresh and you get to do, I mean, I, the stuff I've seen from Minecraft is just astonishing use of the game engine to do something you never would have imagined. So it's, it's a, a set of possibilities. That, that wonderful thing about video games where you, you build a system that has possibilities that even you can't conceive of all the final results of. Um, it has that in spades. So it's just, there's a lot of possibilities there. Great. So we have a question here. Hey. Hi. Hey. Hi, Jack. I'm Jennifer. So, huge fan of 60s, 70s, and 80s cartoons, obviously. Okay. Um, so, uh, I just wanted to know, what do you bring forward into games? What did you bring forward into games from your animation days? And what do you think is gonna you're gonna bring? You know, that's sort of been consistent, or that's had a continuity, or something something that connects the two in a in a way that's you know special to you. Well, to animate, well, you have to do acting, and you have to make it emotional. And I think. This baby is a wonderful example, but we are emotional creatures, and we have these brains, but we're basically feeling creatures trapped in a thinking world. Uh, so the more emotional things are, the more engaging they are, and um, when I have limitations, like I can only have one pose for a character, then I try and make that pose represent their attitude and help their acting. So um, it's, it's trying to take the things that make entertainment work and include those in games and not be blind to those. Great. Great question. And while we're finding if anybody else in the audience has a question, uh, it, it, it brings up something I was talking at, uh, at GDC today with some, with some folks about the role of storytelling in games. And with, with the new advances in neurotechnology, we've actually been able to map in the brain the different parts of the brain that light up 
right? When you're playing a game and shooting something, it's really the medulla oblongata, it's the lower cortex of the brain that's being lit up. And when you're in the, involved in the story, it's the cerebral cortex. It's the higher and more uh, evolved parts of our brains that light up. And so as game developers, we're really beginning to understand the power and the importance of story in game. And so, uh, in, in your work at Disney, do, do you take that into, I mean, obviously Disney's always been about a lot about story, um, but, but how does that play out in, in the new products that you're developing? We try to make them entertaining. We, we test them and see if they are actually working. We interview people and say, what do you know now from this thing? Um, but it's, it's um, I think we all know a lot about stories. Doing stories really well is, is not as easy as it should be. And um, to, to really make characters that engage you and that you respond to takes some effort. So we're trying to learn more and more about that. And we experiment, but we also have a wonderful legacy of characters that people respond to and like, and that's really nice. So we can take advantage of that. Great, we have a question. Thank, thank you for bringing cinematography to uh, the video games, first of all. And second of all, uh, what's the next innovation? The things that actually work are things that are familiar, so I think um, there will be something that we know from another medium that, that comes Maybe through. Maybe factory. Yes. Well, it, the whole problem with smell, it's interesting, you have, to, you have to move the air around. The reason smell of vision in theaters and scratch and sniff stuff is there's this kind of, the air surrounding you has to be moved. So if we get virtual reality with a fan so you can deliver it and take it away. But they had a whole issue with trying to get the air in the theater with the smell on to the next thing. So there are issues with that. Yeah, I was really interested by all uh, your slides, uh, which um, showed the sort of little history of graphics in video games. It's really fascinating, and I was wondering uh, what uh, I mean. We went from static hand drawings to uh, pixel uh, pixel pictures and uh, more like realistic uh, 3D uh, graphics. And I was wondering what the, the necessity of coherence between different media in the transmedia games, uh, what does it bring uh, as new challenge for graphic and visual artists? Does it bring new, does it, does it bring a necessity for new tools or new skills or what are the new challenges for graphic artists in terms of you know, character design or, or yeah, visual arts? New tools are always fun. I'm, I'm a big fan of new tools. Um, my son one time, I told him, the Sims is a really hard game to work on. It's kind of a sandbox. And he thought about it for a while. He looks at me and he says, give people really cool shovels. <laughs> but that's how I think of tools. I mean, a good tool allows you to do things you want to do more easily and without the other levels of thinking that are involved. Um, it's interesting. I don't know if it's a perfect response to that. Has everyone heard of the uncanny valley? Is that like, but, but there's this thing when you're trying to make things realistic that it actually gets harder and harder to make them actually convincing. And I really appreciate stylization, you know, The Incredibles versus Final Fantasy X. Um, that, that, um, I, I think that stylization helps and graphic stylization helps. And I think that that's a real realm for exploration. In, in the old 2D stuff, it's interesting, you could freeze a character, they could move and they could stop, and they could get away with that in 2D. In 3D, if you stop a character, it's dead. I mean, you can just tell that it's frozen and it looks really wrong. So, I think stylization is wonderful. Any software tools that make closer to you having a cool idea and being able to realize it is wonderful, because it's usually pretty complicated to get to stuff that you can see back. That's what I would say. We have another question here. Uh, hi. Um, I wanted to ask you about your opinion in, in games that connect the actual physical space of the city. That's, it's something that we had a challenge in uh, Startup Weekend. Uh -huh. And they asked us to uh, connect the, to use the physical space of the city as part of your app. So is it something that interests you and you might be want to get involved with or is it something that you find creepy? Like this paint on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think do, you, do you find it creepy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't find it creepy. It sounds like exercise. Um, I, I think it would get people moving around. I mean, I know there's there's already. We were just talking in the car on the way here. There's an app 
sonar? Have people heard of that? You, you can tell what friends are near you. You're saying it could also be used for stalking. Yeah. <laughs> but I, there's all kinds of possibilities there in terms of, you know, people play paintball. You can play a game where you have to find three people and you all agree to start at the same time and you try to move around and track each other. I mean, I, I can imagine lots of possibilities for that. Um, offhand, I don't have any particular feeling one way or the other, but I think there's things that could be found there. Would you be interested in being part of a project that does that? What kind of time commitment are you talking about? <laughs> no, I, I mean in general. Uh -huh. Since you moved in so many fields, uh -huh. you went to Atari, Disney. I, I, Ch Chuck has actually been in the, the world of theater, too. <laughs> yeah. and, and he plays, in, and he's a musician as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> I wrote a script for a sitcom and shot it, but I had a really bad main actor. So, it's, uh, so I would imagine that if he had an ARG, uh, that, that Chuck would want to get involved with yeah. it. We can talk about <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I think that that's actually a really great place to, to uh, kind of begin to wrap things up. I, I've got some, you know, some final comments and then wanted to know, you know, um, just in a really quick uh, you know, let's do like a lightning round of what you think is going to be something that you'll see in the future. So, what do you think about Google Glasses? I, oh. I haven't heard of Google Glasses. Are they? I've, I've seen one image on the internet, and I don't know what it means. So, tell me a little bit about Google Glasses. They're supposed to actually be like a projection of the system to, that reflects back on your eye, so that you see the screen right in front of you. You're wearing your laptop. You're wearing your laptop. <laughs> Uh, it could be okay. I mean, I, I think I think what killed virtual reality is that people were embarrassed about what they look like to anyone watching them. Uh, so uh, you know, I think if it's convenient, it'll probably be fine. I mean, people have to spend so much effort actually holding their cell phones <laughs> now. You wouldn't even have to bother to do that. So um, it, it's amazing to me. I have seen the transfer, you've all seen it, but I wait for BART and everybody has a cell phone and everybody looks like a little chimp doing delicate gestures <laughs> on your phone. Um, so, you know, then you just have it on your glasses and you wouldn't even have to worry about that. So, you will probably get used to it and have fun with it. Great, great. So, are there any other questions here tonight? So I, I just want to say, you know, I, I so myself appreciate, you know, the, the history and the experience that Chuck brings uh, to this industry. And as we're all moving forward into the future, uh, it's really important for us to look back on where we came from. Because you never know when you're designing for a window this big when you're going to have to design for a window that big again. Uh, these things come around again. And one of the things that Chuck was saying is that, you know, this idea of play and emotion is such a primal human uh, force. Uh, and now one of the things that we're discovering with neurogaming uh, is the fact that, you know, the way that we play prepares us uh, for our lives and actually can bring great joy and education to our worlds. So, uh, you know, we're here tonight to celebrate all the game makers uh, and, uh, and Chuck Eiler in particular. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. I'd love to see these games happen. It's very nice. Great. And so, you know, before I'm gonna I'm gonna let you all go in just one second, and there's more champagne and pizza and food, and Chuck finally gets a glass of champagne. Yeah. Somebody get Chuck a glass of champagne. Uh, we've got just a couple of announcements uh, before before we uh, break here. Uh, our next transmedia meetup is called Transmedia Transformations. We're going to be looking at crowd uh, crowdsourced story creation, collaborative creation of stories myths and memes and we've got some incredible speakers that are coming to that we're doing that in concert with the producers guild of america and we're really excited about that event and uh, one of our reps of pga is here tonight oh that's for chuck i heard the champagne pop. <laughs> hi i'm susan bell i'm a board member of the producers guild uh, northwest chapter and I just want to let everyone know in the gaming community that gaming producers are eligible for membership in our new media council. So I'll be back by the sign, which is near the champagne. If you're interested <laughs> in learning about the Producers Guild, uh, come talk to me. Thanks. Great. Thank you. And then one of our uh, members, oh, sorry, Jennifer, come on up. 
Um, I just put this one on. Uh, has an announcement about her. Um, she had a, a, a Kickstarter campaign that was uh, incredibly successful, and her uh, her campaign is now live. So um, I'm here to invite everybody to join my crowdsource art project. It starts here with a coloring book that makes kids out of artists and makes artists out of everyone else. And it's full of abstract designs that you can decorate any way you want. And this is just an excuse to collaborate online, to show your work, to uh, join a community, to um, be part of something fun and creative. This is the first of 26 books. It's a multi-dimensional. There's a bunch of information on the website. These books are free to anybody who would like one tonight. Just find me and uh, join up. We'd be delighted to have you as part of the project. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Please do check out the student artwork and join me once again in thanking Chuck Eiler for uh, for being here with us tonight. Thank you.